You guys okay? All right. Um, Pleistocene survivors, you can use the term Pleistocene and Ice Age is kind of the same thing. Pleistocene is a technical term. So we're going to talk about animals that survived the extinctions at the end of the Ice Age. Everyone just calls me Dr. Bob. PhD is not in paleontology or in archaeology. It is an exceptional child education. I've taught for 35 years in Pinellas County Schools. It also is an adjunct at the University of South Florida in exceptional child education. So this is strictly a hobby. As my wife says, by the time you get to the fourth book, it's an obsession. So anyway, I uh, spent a lot of time with it. So when most of us think of the Ice Age, we think of these huge glaciers that were coming down from the north down into America. And we think of mammoths and saber cats and other Ice Age animals walking around in a frozen tundra. And these glaciers were massive. They came down, and if you were to walk up to the edge of the glacier back then, and look up, and up and up, they were from a mile and a half to two miles straight up of ice. They were massive. Think about today's oceans, and how much water would you have to remove from the oceans to lower the oceans by one inch? There was enough ice on the top to lower the seas 300 feet or 100 meters, which is actually a little more than 300 feet. So Florida was this huge, huge, wide peninsula, much more massive than it is today. So there was so much ice on North and South America that it actually distorted the shape of the Earth. Now, we wouldn't have noticed it had we been alive back then, but whatever, however they measure those things, we are still in the process of an isostatic rebound, which means the Earth is still getting rounder and rounder, and especially with global warming, as there's less weight up on top of the North and South Pole, it's rebounding still. We may also think of dire wolves, saber cats, mastodons, glyptodonts, giant crown sloths, giant bison, ice age horses, and a menagerie of other beasts that are no longer with us. That's what most people think of when they think of the ice age. What we really think of is, say, the white-tailed deer and a host of other Ice Age survivors that are still with us. Odeocoilus virginiensis, white-tailed deer that they go out and hunt with food bambi. Same deer that was around throughout the entire Ice Age. And the Ice Age started about 2.58 million years ago and went to about 10 to 15,000 years ago, 12,000, somewhere in there where the first humans started coming into North America and down into Florida. At the end of the Ice Age, there was a mass extinction of the megafauna of North America and much of the rest of the world, except for the African continent, which only lost about 50% of its megafauna. We lost a lot more. A large portion of, the portion of the terrestrial animals weighing 44 kilograms 97 pounds, so we roughly say 100 pounds, anything larger than that for the most part died out. Only four real survivors that were larger than that in Florida, we're going to talk about them in a minute. So all these large beasts, and the large beasts that preyed on them, saber cats, American lions, so on and so forth, they all went extinct. North America was the hardest hit at the end of the Ice Age. We lost about 90 genera containing 75% of all megafauna. This is overall North America, not just Florida. We're gone by some 12,700 years ago. Along with the animals from Florida, other parts of North America lost the shrub ox, stag, moose, Harlan's musk ox, 13 species of pronghorn, and a nine foot long saber toothed salmon in Alaska. So bizarre looking critter that they found fossils of. What caused the Ice Age megafaunal extinctions? There's a lot of theories. The four major ones were overhunting. Humans came in across the land bridge, started killing too many animals, severe climate change, spread of disease, and an extraterrestrial impact, which would be a comet or a meteorite hitting the Earth, like what most people are familiar with that killed the dinosaurs out 65 million years ago. The causes might not have been a mutual exclusive. Two, three, or maybe all four of these things working in conjunction might have killed the megafauna off. As bands of humans came over, 
North America is a massive continent with massive, massive herds of beasts. They could not have possibly overhunted that quickly. But humans also came over with dogs and some other animals that came across that might have also spread disease. And now you got humans and disease. Climate change. We know that the ice age was, you know, it came warm and cold. But the ice age from 2.58 million to 12,700 years ago had multiple highs and lows. And those animals always survived. Never had an issue until the end. But if a drastic climate change comes, along with some overhunting, along with the spread of disease, and possibly an extraterrestrial impact, maybe not a great big huge one that knocked off the dinosaurs, but now they're believing that there's evidence that there was a comet that broke up and there were these massive meteor showers that hit Michigan, Minnesota, and that, and, and gunked up the atmosphere and whatever else. So, so they may have also contributed. When we talk about the end of the issue, we really talk about the survivors. Why don't we talk about them? Most survivors weren't big, so they weren't impressive like a big mammoth or a saber cat. They weren't exotic, so they weren't some fancy thing like a glyptodon or a giant ground sloth. They were mostly common animals that we find in today's environment right here in Florida. Many people don't realize they were even alive. I remember the first time I was in Lysi Shell Pit 30 some odd years ago, and I found a, um, a deer, I guess, I think it was an ankle bone, whatever I found, and I found a part of a deer, and I was like, wow, so what kind of deer was it? And they're like, white-tailed deer. Same one you have today. I'm like, really? And Lysi was dated 1.8 million years ago, right here in Florida. So they're like, okay, well, they had the same deer and we have it today. I just, I was always thinking everything back in the ice age, gone and dead. So why should we be, why should we be talking about We know why we don't talk about them. They're often overlooked stories important because they were the ones that made it through that ice age extinctions. During our current mass extinction event, we should be looking at why something survived and made it through. Now there were five major mass extinctions in the history of the Earth from 4.5 billion years ago to today that are accepted. And there's tons of scientists that will tell you right now that we are currently in the sixth, what they call the sixth extinction. So if you go from the late 1700s, the Industrial Revolution 1800s, through today, more animals have gone extinct faster than any of the other five major mass extinctions put combined. And if you go from, with the global warming and how fast the Earth is warming up, if you go post-World War II to today, and you look at the curve of how things are going, and also you hit post-World War II, and that curve of carbon dioxide and global warming just goes shoot skyrocket. So we're in, we're in possibly a current mass extinction. It's kind of important to know who survived and how, and how did he do it. Those of us who have been hunting fossils in Florida for any length of time, we have found remains of critters that are still with us today. Many times it's difficult to tell whether these remains are fully... So if I find a deer, is that deer remains, is it 2 million years old, or is it 20,000 years old, or did Uncle Harry just shoot it and skin it and throw the bones in the river? You know, I mean, uh, we don't know. Well, there is some ways to know. Many of the remains, it's difficult to tell. Deer and alligator, especially, that are found in the rivers, are very hard to tell whether they're fossilized or not. But after you find them and you dry them out, the ones that aren't fossilized, just they disintegrate. The ones that are really rock hard, they're rocks, they ain't fossilized, they're mineralized, so they're gonna last a lot better. These are two baby deer jaws, they're only about this big, and you can see the bite marks. These ones were both taken uh, by carnivores. So they have probably something the size of a bobcat took these at neonatal as soon as they were born, something grabbed them. I think that, that picture is in both, I think this book and this book. So there were at least four large animals that survived the ice age extinctions. They were much larger than a 97 pound or 100 pounds cutoff for megafauna. Black bear, alligator, Florida camp, and manatee, all alive today in Florida, and, and there are they are huge animals, at least, especially um, your manatee, alligators we know get really big, Florida panther 150 up to 200, and uh, black bears can be anywhere from 300 to 500, 600 pounds. It's not the biggest bear, but it's a big bear. These are some bear teeth. 
found those in the Steenhatchee River. I have property up there also. Alligator fossils are common finds because alligators have been around for millions of years. Same alligator for something like, I don't know, throughout the entire ice, it's probably from the Miocene, from probably maybe 20 million years ago on, alligator Mississippiensis. Alligator teeth, alligator scoots. These are the bony ridges on the back of the alligator. And when scientists first started studying them in the 1800s and into the 1920s, oh, look at all this bony protection on the back of the alligator, right underneath the skin. And finally, someone started asking, like, well, why does the alligator need protection? It doesn't have any enemies. At least not until man got to North America. It had this, this same body protection for from 65 million years. The alligator was only back in the time of dinosaurs, at least some form of them. Why would they have this bony protection? It turns out it's not bony protection. First known solar panels. Those are all along the back of the gator and the tails. And an alligator's a cold-blooded animal. It crawls onto the bank. It suns itself. These are directly under the skin, which is why you have the patterns on it. It absorbs all that heat. It then slithers into the nice pool of Florida water. If it's cold-blooded, it immediately becomes sluggish. But if it's cold-blooded, it has something that continues to warm it for another 15, 20 minutes to an hour. It can go in the water and remain active and hunt or do, or get, do whatever it needs to do. So that's what the little story, side story on those. Manatee teeth are another common find. One of the guys, German guys, I um, he used to dive, but he's out in Arizona now. We hit a hole in Santa Fe where I think he found 180 manatee teeth, and I found about 60 just in on one tank, just in that one area. And what we can suppose is that in prehistoric times, that might have been a prehistoric spring. Manatees were the same as they are now. Winter time comes, gets really cold. They go into that spring, they sit there and feed, and they continue to produce teeth and lose teeth. Manatees, we get two teeth. Baby teeth, deciduous teeth are called, and adult teeth. And I tell the kids, you don't take care of them, you get that third set called dentures when you get older. <laughs> so, but manatee, the teeth come in the back and they keep sliding forward. They have glands right here. They digest the roots off and spit them out. They keep coming forward and coming forward throughout their entire lives. Same thing, mammoths, mastodons, Asian African elephants, very closely related to manatee. Same thing, conveyor belt teeth. Keep coming forward, digest the roots off, spit them out. But they're not false, I mean, they're not ivory. They don't have an ivory. Ivory is, de all ivory is, is dentine. So yes, that middle part is, is ivory. Your teeth, you have ivory in your teeth. You have enamel, dentine, and cementum, which is what holds them in your jaws. All teeth have that. So people have this false idea of what ivory is. So you have, wal that's why you have walrus ivory, yeah, elf African elephant elf ivory, and it's that. Those are just, that's just a dentine in their teeth, but it's exaggerated in those big tusks. But that's what ivory is, and each animal has its own pattern called a Schrager pattern in the ivory. So we can tell if ivory is elephant ivory. We can actually tell Asian African, African elephant. You can tell mammoth ivory from mastodon ivory, from gonfalier ivory, which is important because fossil ivory is legal to have. The current animals are not legal to have walrus, ivory, or, or man, uh, elephants in any. So, yeah, so, yeah, a little bit of ivory right in the middle there. A little technical, but yeah. Not so common, but still alive today, Florida Panthers. Harder to find was a free picture from the internet that I could download, because I'm not really a good internet savvy person. Every time I tried to download a picture, it had like a sign across it saying, you know, picture from such and such. I'm like, ah but we pretty much know what a Florida panther looks like. Very endangered, may not be with us for too much longer. What people don't realize is that the Florida panther is a subspecies. The panther in Texas, virtually identical. They could, and they've had people that are pushing to try to introduce at least a handful of Texas panthers into Florida, because otherwise if you keep inbreeding in Florida, eventually they're all gonna go extinct because they're just, they're just inbred because there's not enough Florida panthers left to not have inbreeding. So that's kind of a, you know, you're kind of doing this number, you know, do we do this, then they're not purely Florida panthers. But even the experts can tell the difference in the, in the bone structure of the teeth, so. Many species only went through local mass extinctions. Horses, horses evolved in America, just like camels and, and llamas did. And when land bridge came, horses, camels went that way. People, mammoths, mastodons, bison came this way. 
The horses survived in Asia and eventually in Africa becoming zebras, but all the horses in North America went extinct because that's where they originated from. So they only went through local mass extinctions. Taper, another animal. It migrated across the land bridge, ended up in Asia, now, now kind of South Asia, and South America, and extinct, went extinct in North America. Paleo artist Herman Trapman, who did all the artwork for this book, he put stripes on the prehistoric taper because the South Asian tapers and today's South American tapers have been separated for millions of years. The babies all have those stripes and spots, so we can presume that their ancestral species, where they came from, probably had those. Camel was another one, came from North America, went extinct, but it's in Asia and it's in Africa. That's a nice big camel, of course, on a couple on tables there. That was from the Peace River. All my fossils have a label somewhere on them. Many smaller animals survived the Pleistocene extinction. Here's a little picture of a uh, field mouse. Their story is equally important. Many paleontologists focus um, on reasons for the extinction events with the animals that lost the battle. But often overlooked are these survivors and how they managed to make it through. And we're going to talk about how they made it through in a minute. Other survivors that are often overlooked. Tons of flourish, just a fancy word for plants. Tons of plants, same, you go back in the ice age, it'd be same oak trees, same pine trees, 99% of the same plants. That didn't get affected by the ice age, it's not far. Populations of insects, ice age now, probably almost identical. Amphibians, you know, toads, frogs, that kind of stuff, reptiles, snakes, whatever, turtles, all made it through. A lot of small eye things. And nobody really studies them from the prehistoric times. White-tailed deer we already talked about. So these are some deer jaws off my property in Steve Hatchie. And that's a skull that all came out from under the peat, which means it came out from the early Ice Age uh, layer. Deer was very common even back then. Coyote, another animal that's been around since the Ice Age. Around today, that's a little picture of a half dollar from uh, Standing Liberty, just to give you an idea of size. Very similar to a dog jaw. Virginia possum, made it through the Ice Age. Bobcat, made it through the Ice Age. Now again, these are all animals that are smaller than 100 pounds. Bobcat, not very big. Big compared to your house cat, but not big compared to tiger, lion, or whatever. Nine, our friend the nine banded armadillo. Made it through the ice age. We find their fossils. That's an Indian head penny. So you can see how small the scoots are. And yet if you go out there and you see some of the scoots from the giant armadillo, they're massive compared to these. River otter, made it through. Beaver, Castoroides canadensis, which is the regular today's beaver. 30, 40 pounds, something like that, 48 pounds. Not a very big critter, big enough. Made it through the ice age. Now there was a giant beaver that didn't make it through. That was about a 400 pound beaver. I talked about it in the ice age book there. Skunks, made it through the ice, made it through the extinction. We find fossil skunks, fossil rabbit material. Raccoons, made it through, there were tons of them. Foxes, made it through the extinctions. So many birds we can't even keep track of. They almost all made it through the bird the bird fauna in the Ice Age was probably almost identical to the bird fauna now. we are getting hammered a little more lately the last two, three hundred years compared to what it was. But the birds made it through. So this is a uh, wood ibis. We've all seen them romping around in Florida. Same, I found that off my property in Steve Hatch in Dixon County in the, in the river. I have a beautiful, this past summer, I've got a beautiful eagle claws. Probably this big. The eagle claws are massively big. Now, whether it was a bald eagle, golden eagle, there's another type of eagle, I can't remember. Hard to say, but the eagles were around. Raptors. Oh, yeah, so I do have the eagle. Well, you can see compared to a half dollar how big it is. So I wasn't sure I had it, you know, in the slide presentation. Every one of these turtle shells is a piece of turtle shells from a different type of turtle or tortoise. They all made it through. Numerous snakes made it through. Some snake vertebrae. You can see they're not very big compared to a nickel. Numerous bats made it through. The giant vampire bat did not make it through, but all the other bats did. Um, again, it says giant vampire bat, which is uh, Desmodus magnus, is 
is still only about this big. Today's vampire bats only an ounce and a half. We watch the vampire movies and you see this big, you know, and or the monsters and grandpa turns into this big bat. No, 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 it's not like that. Bats are really, really little. And vampire bats have to be incredibly, incredibly small. And in the Ice Age Florida book, I explained it to him. They, they land on animals that are sleeping. They land on the ground, jump on the animals that are sleeping, shave a spot of fur off the animal while it's sleeping that it doesn't know what it's doing. Their teeth are so small and thin and sharp, they then inject a, a thing that keeps the blood from coagulating so they'll keep bleeding. And they sit there and just slurp up blood for 20 minutes till their bellies are twice as full as the, the, the vampire, if it's an ounce and a half, might take almost an ounce of fluid in, almost double its weight, then fly off and go back to roost and feed its babies, if it had babies, if it's a mother vampire, whatever. Vampire bats are really, really little. Almost all the fish species, at least in Florida, all made it through the megafaunal extinction. We only know that great big saber-toothed salmon I showed you being one of the few things that went extinct at the end of the Ice Age. But the ultimate survivor was man. So, and we don't know if the first paleo people in Florida, where they went extinct, or did they just become culturally more advanced, because we know we don't find their kind of tools at the end of the Ice Age, the ones that they were using before. Or did they become assimilating into other cultures that were entering here? We may never know exactly what happened to them. In this picture, Herman is from the Ice Age book. It's a Paleo Indian. He's making fire now. I know they see the thing in the Boy Scouts. They had to rub two sticks together to make fire. The, the Indians never did that. Their life depended on having fire, protection, cooked food, uh, warmth in the wintertime. You couldn't take for chance, I'm going to rub two sticks together and maybe I'll make fire. It ain't happening. They had a stick with a bow, called a bow bearing with a bow on top, and they would, with a cord wrapped around the stick, and they would saw it back and forth and make that stick spin unbelievably fast. And in the friction, they'd have a little pile, it says oak leaves here, but they could have a little pile of tinder, and hopefully it would get hot enough where it would get sparked, and they would blow on and they'd get fire. And Herman, when I saw him, he had made a replica one. He came into my driveway, he put the little piece down. Maybe 15 seconds, he had fire going. Just that quick. Boom. Now, it wasn't, it was great conditions, warm and sunny or whatever. But even in, so they would carry this tinder and these pieces in a little pouch with them. Because they, they could be on a hunting party, maybe it's raining. They had to have that dry stuff with them. They had to be able to make fire. They had to be able to make it almost instantly. They weren't rubbing two sticks together for a half hour. A fallacy. So an additional pressure on the survivors. There was a human presence before, during, and after the megafaunal extinction. So humans came. We were here for about 2,000 years before the megafauna goes extinct. And we're here during and after. So those animals that did survive should have had more pressure, hunting pressure on them the deer, the, the black bear, you know, once everything else is extinct, that they should have been turning and hunting, and yet those animals all survived anyway, even with all that extra hunting pressure on them. Save for harvesting marine life on the inshore and stuff. There should have been way more pressure on harvesting once all the megafauna and all that stuff went extinct, and yet all that stuff survives. Somehow all that stuff survived. So why did these creatures survive? Many of these creatures were generalists of some kind or another. Bears, skunks, possums, coyotes, alligators, fox, they eat a whole wide variety of foods. So just because so if some kind of cataclysmic thing happens, hurricane, this and that, totally devastational hurricane area, alligator and turtles go, okay, whatever, we'll wait till things clear up and go on our merry way. So humans are the ultimate survivors because we are the ultimate generalists. We will live almost anywhere from now, from the Arctic Circle all the way down to the Antarctic. Uh, we will eat almost anything. We'll eat rutabagas, artichokes, snails, scum cabbage, ding-dongs and ho-hos. I put those in there because I like those. I put the first ones in it just amazed me if you eat those. So, um, and we can overcome almost any kind of obstacle, humans. So we can adapt and survive in almost any environment. So, so far, humans have been the ultimate survivor and reproducer. Now that may not go on way, way into the future if we keep screwing the world up. But, right now, we've taken over. So, 
three of the four largest survivors need our help, needed our, needed our help to survive today. The American black bear has a large geographic range that far exceeds Florida's boundaries. There's black bear all over North America. And they're not endangered yet. Not yet here. Placed on the endangered species list, the manatee's long-term survival in the, in the wild is very, very doubtful. Due to degradation, increased boat traffic, or whatever, this year another bat took manatees to another huge hit. I don't think they'll make it into the next century. It'd be so shocking if they make it out of this century. Long-term survival of the Florida panther is also doubtful. They've needed human assistance to make it so far, and they're still, because we keep building and building, there's less habitat, less habitat, and what happens is some of those populations also become isolated. So if I'm one of the last Florida panther, and I'm running around in near Palace State Forest, I'm not really hooking up with the one Florida panther that's down in, in the Everglades. You know, so it, it's getting hard, so they're gonna eat it. The alligator once was on the endangered species list, but with human protection has made the greatest comeback of any animal to the point where it's a nuisance again. I mean, there's alligators all over the place. I mean, the alligator did, did come back with a vengeance once we protected it. Now, one of the other things that came back, believe it or not, with an unbelievable, it only took one act of uh, protection, was your raptors, ospreys, bald eagles, all the other types of eagles, hawks. They were all going extinct because of a chemical called DDT that they were spraying on the fields. And it was an insecticide. And then they weren't eating insects, but they were eating rodents and other things that were eating the insects of DDT. And how DDT affected all those large raptors was their eggs weren't viable. They would lay an egg and the egg would be so fragile it would just fall apart. The minute they stopped using DDT, all eagles, all those birds came back. I don't want to say with a vengeance because there's still a lot of habitat loss. But they came back where they're no longer these major endangered species. The bald eagle is no longer uh, it's on the endangered. I'm sure it's definitely protected. I can tell you that right now. So no, you can't even own eagle feathers or anything like that. But it's not one of the major endangered species anymore. So that was a picture of my thing for Channel 10 like four or five years ago to promote this. I did Channel 10 again this year. It was a different. The hosts always seem like they're different on the show or whatever, which is fine. I've done it for about 10 years. So, I have some books here that explain stuff. One of the things with fossils is most people want to know two things about a fossil. How old is it? No, first one, what is it? How old is it? So if you really get into it, you want to know, okay, what is it? How old is it? And why is it shaped this way? Know a little bit more about it. So that's what I wrote when your fossils can tell you. And it explains a lot of stuff. But most people are still using the book because there's over 800 pictures in it to identify the fossils, to know what it is and how. It wasn't meant as an ID book, but that's how a lot of people are using it. The fossil dive book is good whether you dive, snorkel, screen washing. It gives you about a thousand miles of river access in the state of Florida. It also tells you how to preserve your fossils, how to label them. None of the other books went into that. I'm not sure why. And the book that just came out a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago or so, Ice Age Florida in story and art with paleo artist Herman Trappin, his artwork is unbelievable. So now I want to know what is it, how old is it, why is it shaped that way, okay so how did this animal behave, what was it like? Every chapter opens up with unbelievable mural by Herman Trappin. On the back of that mural is a fact sheet that tells you the down and dirty facts about the animal because I would read books and go, Ooh, yeah, how much is a mammoth eat? Oh, let me go back to the mammoth book. And I'd spend 25 minutes trying to find that one sentence that told me a mammoth ate 400 pounds of vegetation a day or whatever. So this has a fact sheet that immediately you can go right to and find the facts about the animal. Then there's then a story from their umbelt. That means a story from the animal's perspective of what it was like to live a day in the Ice Age as a mammoth, a mastodon, a saber cat, a giant ground sloth. Then there's a discovery narrative, how I found the fossils that led to that story, or with the rarer fossils, how some other very famous fossil people found those fossils that led to the story. And then finally, there's tons of pictures of the fossils, so some people are using this as somewhat of an ID book too, because there's over 100 pictures of fossils in here also. Does anyone have any questions about what we talked about, the survivors? I say it's survivors. Yes, buddy, what do you got? I want to know if I want to know if alligators were alive before sharks. Were alligators alive before sharks? That's a good question. I want to say no. I think alligators have been around for over 200 million years, at least in some form. And, and 
the I mean, sharks have been alive for over 200 million years. Alligators probably came at the end of the time of dinosaurs, at least alligators as we know, alligators, crocodiles, and there's a thing called caimans. They're all closely rated. They go back pretty far. Both of them go back way, way back. So, I think I was in high school when they were first coming around. Uh, I'm not quite that old. But anyway, so, any other questions? Ah, I covered that perfectly. Unbelievable. So anyway, I'll be up front if everybody's interested in a book. But, but one of the key things I can tell people, if you really want to learn some stuff, join a fossil club near you. It doesn't have to be our Tampa Fossil Club. If you live somewhere else, Google it. Find a fossil club near you. Join them. They'll take you on trips. They'll have We have presentations once a month where you get to hear speakers like me or we're bringing people from Gainesville or wherever else. So anyway, with that being said, and I can also help you ID stuff if you have Yesterday at Peace Service, they were already finding stuff. It looks like an arrowhead. No, soft shell turtle. It's just a fragment. No, thanks. Yeah.